Now, we've been doing From the Ground Up for about five or six weeks now. Um, today, we're starting the capital campaign that shares the same name, uh, From the Ground Up. And I just want to give us uh, an announcement of where we currently are, uh, also where we're going. Next week, we're going to watch a really cool video. It talks about uh, our history. It shares three or four families' experience with the church. And then also, it will give us a glimpse uh, into our future. Now, I'm going to give you some information. Um, it's got a lot of numbers and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there's going to be a detailed brochure that arrives in your mailbox uh, this week. And it's going to have all these numbers. It's going to have a lot of specifics. It's a 12-page uh, brochure. It has renderings of uh, what the church is going to look like. Um, the, all the budget, all the number type stuff as well. So take a close look at that. This is a really exciting time uh, for our church. Um, so the Sunday before Thanksgiving, it's uh, five weeks from this morning, we're going to be having our Commitment Sunday where we're going to be asking uh, the church uh, to make a three-year commitment to uh, move us from the school out to the church property. This is really, I, I believe, um, a once-in-a-lifetime experience to be part of a, a a new congregation that's trying to do what we're doing. Um, there is no other church in Omaha right now that's trying to do what we're doing. And, you know, we got this land uh, three years ago from your generosity. I was out with a family, um, I think I was at their house, it was like Thursday or Friday, and they just moved into uh, one of the new houses, and it actually overlooks the church property. And it's kind of on the hill up above the church property, and I was looking out their back window, and it was amazing to see just like, hundreds, probably thousands of, of rooftops that, you know, we're going to be the closest church to. And, you know, all the development to the east is fully sold out and, you know, to the west, um, you know, that's starting to be developed. But we have like a really rare opportunity in front of us to reach people for Jesus Christ. Um, and that's what I'm asking us to invest in. So we have uh, two goals for the campaign. The basic goal is $2 million. This will allow us uh, to move forward um, with the project. So that's the minimum. If uh, we get less than that, we won't be able to, to uh, move forward. Now, um, to move forward, um, it not, to do this uh, with just uh, with a $2 million, um, we will have to sell one acre of land. Um, the corner of 195th and Harrison Street. Um, it's got a market value of probably about five to $700,000. Um, you know, we could sell that. That would give us cash of uh, 2.5 to $2.7 million. Um, now, to not sell that property, we would need to raise $2.5 million. So those are the two goals. One of them's a planting goal and one of them's a harvest goal. Um, I believe that we can do this. Now, I've talked to uh, 10 families so far. I'm going to have conversations with uh, two or three more in the next few days. Uh, these 10 families have already pledged $500,000. Uh, so we are one-fourth the way there to our basic goal, and we're 20% of the way um, to our stretch goal. Now, these families have done some heavy lifting. Um, it's been just a blessing for me to hear their story. There's, uh, there's one family that's actually going to sell something and then uh, give the proceeds to the church. Yeah, there's another family. Um, there's, they were young. Like, they're a lot younger than I am. Um, yeah, I was driving up to their house, and they're one of our most generous families. And, you know, at the end of this conversation, I, I like, they, their kids are younger than my kids. And I looked at them, and I was like, you know, unless you guys have some wealth that I'm not aware of, um, you know, like, you're actually probably given, like, you know, 14 or 15 percent of your income to the church over the next three years. And the man looked at me, and he smiled, and uh, he said, no, it's, it's more than that. Um, you know, that's commitment. That's sacrifice. Uh, you know, there's another family that was going to do something, and they're going to put that off, um, you know, for three years so they can do this. Uh, you know, so 10 families at $500,000, each of these families is playing this $50,000. Um, you know, this is not coming easy for anybody. It's not going to be easy for any of us. But you know what? Um, I, I've been just been thinking about this over the last couple of weeks and even months. Um, you know, there was a day, like, and I've talked about this before, and you guys have heard it before, but, you know, there was a day that, like, we bought a van for release ministries, and you know, it was like it was like twelve thousand dollars or something we gave them, and I, we just did it in one Sunday. Um, you know, there's days that we've you know raised three or four thousand dollars for missionaries, and then there was a day. Remember when we bought the building? Um, there are offices that we had to buy like thirty thousand dollars, and or we needed like a hundred thousand dollars, and you all gave like a hundred and twenty-five. And there was a day that we purchased the land, we needed a million, and you gave like one point two five million. Um, and I just believe that God just keeps uh, raising the bar for us. 
you know, started with a few thousand, then it goes to tens, 10,000, it goes to 100,000, now it goes to a million, and we're embarking on a huge project. We have never failed at any of our projects, and I don't believe that we will fail with this one either. But it's, uh, it's going to take some sacrifice, it's going to take some commitment, and I want us all to pray uh, the prayer, um, and this is the prayer of our campaign, and just, just pray this prayer. The prayer goes something like this, Lord, what do you want to do through me? Lord, what do you want to do through me? And just keep praying that prayer. Now, if you're a guest with us and this is like your first time here, um, this stuff does not apply to you. Um, <laughs> now, you're more than welcome to give. Uh, give me a call and we'll talk about that. But uh, this, is, uh, this is for our people. And you know, I eventually hope that one day you're one of our people. Um, I would say if you're early in your journey with us, worship with us at this time, um, you know, join our groups, connect, serve with us, grow with us. But for all of us who call the Water's Edge home, um, I just invite us to follow along this process the next, uh, you know, four or five weeks. And I really believe that in December I'll be able to make an announcement that, um, you know, in two, two and a half years, we will not be worshiping in high school anymore. Um, us and much of our community will, will, uh, will be worshiping uh, at 195th and Harrison Street. Um, that's our home, and uh, we're going to go from the wilderness uh, to the promised land. It's going to take a lot of work to get there, but I am just so grateful uh, for all the families who have already stepped up They've committed, they've sacrificed, and I'm grateful for all those who are going to in the future as well. So, um, really, as, I, as I'm talking, just you, you got your little uh, uh, gratitude card. I want you to fill these out. Um, you know, hopefully, you have a pen. If not, try to borrow one from someone by you. But as I'm talking, just, just fill this thing up, and, and at the end of the worship service, you're going to come forward and receive communion, and this will be our uh, offering to God today. So, I want to take us back uh, 30 years. Um, so I was uh, in the back seat of a, a car. Um, it was a little compact car. I remember those cars like in the mid-1980s were kind of boxy. It was one of those cars. And I was in the passenger side seat in the, uh, the back seat of the car. Um, we were driving from my hometown of uh, Lorenz, Iowa to Mankato, Minnesota. Now there's really uh, like two reasons you would go to Mankato. One is there's a college there. The other, in the winter, there's a really cool uh, ski place there. So that's where people in the Midwest would go to ski. It's nothing like what they have in Colorado, but you know, for the Midwest, it was really cool. And as we were getting there, I just I started to feel uncomfortable with the way the guy was driving. But like, if you have like a 17-year-old friend and you're like 15, um, you don't want to like criticize his driving. Um, but I just I did not feel comfortable. He was going too fast, and the roads were kind of icy. And all of a sudden, we're going down a fairly steep hill, and there was a turn at the bottom of the hill, and uh, he locked the brakes of the car. And all of a sudden, like, we were just, like, sliding down this hill. Now, um, there was a truck that was coming the other way. Um, this truck was right in front of us, and we probably missed this truck maybe by about, about 10 yards or so. It's tough to say. It all happened so fast, but it was very close. Now, coming at me um, on the curve was a, a, a big semi-tractor trailer. Um, now, I looked out the passenger window. We had just missed this uh, passenger truck. And this great big tractor trailer was coming at us. And again, I don't know how far he missed us by, but it wasn't more than probably like 10 feet at this point. I mean, there's probably about like 30 yards between these two vehicles, and somehow we just got right in the middle of them. Now, our problems were just beginning at that point. Um, you know, there was a curve on the road, and that actually acted like a ramp for us. And all four of us in this little car, we <laughs> didn't intend to, but we went flying. I don't know how far we, we, we landed down at the bottom of this hill. Thankfully, it was a large uh, pile of snow. As we got out of the car, three of the four of us were able to get out of the car. Uh, one was pinned in the car. You know, I, I looked up, and there was one of those great big cement um, drainage things that, like, storm water would flow through, and it was about halfway up the hill. And I don't think it would have been possible for us to miss that by more than a couple feet. Um, so, you know, the ambulance came, the people came and, you know, helped us up or whatever. And I'll never forget that day, even though it was 30 years ago. Um, that was a day that changed my life. And it, it, it changed my life for the better. You know, my friend that was in the car that got injured, you know, he was fine. And, you know, but, but that wasn't the thing for me. The thing for me um, was that pretty much every day since then I've been grateful. Now, I'm really sad that it took something like that for me. Um, you know, to, you know, experience gratitude in my life. But, you know, when times get tough, um, you know, if I get down about the past or anxious about the future, 
Yeah, I remember what it was look. I remember what it was like to you know see that big truck coming right at me. Yeah, I remember what it was like for those few seconds to just be in the middle of the air and land at the bottom of the ditch. Yeah, I remember I was never so thankful in my life up to that point. Um, you know, being able to you know, we couldn't open the door. I actually had to roll down the window and to crawl out of that car. You know, and um, what I want, I mean, I, I want you to consider this, like, uh, you know, what would your life look like? And just think about this question. What would your life look like if you had an attitude of gratitude? Okay, so you woke up this morning, right? Um, you get to pick your attitude. Nobody else does. You get to choose your attitude. You know, the other people in your house, the circumstances, the boss, the teacher, uh, the neighbor, whoever else, nobody gets to choose your attitude except you. That's your responsibility. Now, I don't think an attitude of gratitude is enough, but just think, like, what would your life look like if you chose gratitude most days, most of the time? Now, the second question I want you to consider is this. Um, what would your life look like if you not only had an attitude of gratitude, but you practiced attitude daily? Now, um, this is, uh, this is like, let me think about this. Like, when I say gratitude, I'm not talking about being polite. So I think it was like Wednesday or Thursday, David and I got to spend uh, a lot of the day together, and we ended at this restaurant, and um, this restaurant, he, he loves to go because uh, what do you, he orders the same thing every time. He orders uh, macaroni and cheese with a side of macaroni and cheese. <laughs> so uh, they know, they see this little short blonde kid coming in, and they say, hey, macaroni and cheese with a side of macaroni and cheese. And, you know, so we're like uh, sitting there, and then he gets Robert and the, um, you know, the person, he, he, he did the Robert and like the, she filled it back up for him, and, and he didn't say thank you, and I got on his case, and I said, David, you really probably should have said thank you there. That's like the polite thing to do. Then I knew I was going to be talking about this uh, on Sunday, and he was kind of out making the rounds. He actually knew a few people there, and I was thinking about like, um, yeah, that's one of the perks of being a pastor's kid, I guess, and uh, so um, he knew like, uh, so I was thinking about like this whole gratitude thing, and um, there's a different, I, I believe this one word, this one word, thanks, you know, that word thanks, it, it can totally change your life. And not thanks, like, it's a polite thing to do, uh, you know, for filling my thing. Because I believe that you can actually be ungrateful and polite at the same time. Um, you can be ungratefully, ungrateful and, like, socially acceptable at the same time. But um, what I'm talking about, it, it looks a little bit different. So what I was thinking um, as far as, like, the difference between being polite and having gratitude is, like, having gratitude would be, like, okay, it's really cool for me to come to this place and have somebody make my meal, serve my meal, and clean up for me. Like, it's really cool that I can do that. Um, I was thinking, um, as I sit here, I'm really blessed, I'm really grateful that I get to sit here and share this meal with someone who loves me and someone that I love. You know, when David eventually made his way back, um, you know, we were laughing, and I, I, I thought, like, it's really cool um, that I get to laugh with someone because that's a blessing that uh, God gives to us. You know, it was like 8 o'clock at night, and I was thinking, it's, it's really cool that, you know, it's 8 o'clock at night, and I still have energy. And for most of my life, I've been healthy with, like, the exception of this little groin injury. I've, I've you know, been blessed with, like, vitality for the first 45 years of my life. You know, that's the difference between gratitude and being polite. Now, um, one of the things that I, I do, um, one of the things that I do, and I've done this for almost 20 years, I started in 1997 when I was a first-year graduate student at uh, the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. The professor was a spiritual formation class, and the first day he said, what I want you to do this semester is I want you to just keep this little journal of everything that you're grateful for. Just start today, and you know, we talked about it throughout the semester. We talked about it in small groups. We talked about it as the whole class, and I would say it was one of the most meaningful spiritual experience. It was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. Now, I probably got, I'm guessing, 15 to 18 of these books that are full. I mean, I have hundreds of pages of just one little word, um, you know, a little sentence, a little phrase, sometimes a short paragraph of uh, things that I'm grateful for. Um, you know, I, I do that, and I think it's important to, like, do this on days when, you f when, it's, when it's easy. Um, and I, I think it's really important 
to do it on days when it's tough. You know, I think when life seems like it's a little bit too much, when we've got a lot of problems, I think the best thing that we can do is sit down and write three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten things that we're thankful for. Because I think that most of us, like, we're pretty good most of the time. I think that some of us have some big issues. And I think what happens when we've got these issues or these challenges in front of us is we'll spend, like, 80 or 90 or 95 percent of our time and our energy on this one thing. And, like, we'll overlook um, all those really cool things. You know, we're not focusing on the blessings. We're focusing on the, on the problems. And, you know, as I look at my books, it's really interesting to go back and review them sometimes. Um, I can say, okay, this one was written during a really, really tough season, I can tell. You know, this one was written uh, during a pretty good season, I, I, I can tell. And, you know, um, I assume the boys probably one day are going to have all these books that they're not going to know what to do with. And, yeah, they're going to read through those, and they're going to see uh, their name in there um, many, many times. Um, yeah, they're going to see other things, places I've been, the people who bless me. As I look out here, um, you know, all of you are a blessing to me. And think about this, like, if we don't let other people know that they're a blessing to us, um, you know, it's like this form, I mean, it's an attitude of gratitude, but we're not practicing the gratitude. Yeah, I got in there, like, where I've seen God's work in the world, the place that I've been able to go, the, the grace and the hope and the experience that, I forgive, uh, that I've experienced. Um, now, listen to Paul's advice here to uh, the Colossian Christians. It's found in Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 15. Um, and Paul says, And always be thankful. Okay, so this is Paul. Um, I've talked a lot about Paul over the years. So Paul actually uh, watched this guy named Stephen um, be stoned to death because of what he believed. Paul was a Jew at the time. Stephen was a Christian. All these guys threw all these rocks at Stephen and killed him. And Paul could have done something to stop it, but he didn't. He watched Stephen die. Now Paul, after his conversion, um, I mean, he went to jail more times than you can count because of what he believed. Not because of what he did, but because of what he believed. You know, at the end of Paul's life, he was persecuted because of his faith. Paul knew what it was like to have a tough life. He knew what it was like to be belittled. He knew what it was like to be mocked. Let, listen to the advice that he gives. He says, and always be thankful. During those good times when it's so easy to take things for granted, always be thankful. During those bad times, during those challenges, when it's tough to be grateful, Paul says, always be thankful. Now, what I believe is the world needs less people taking life for granted and more people appreciating and enjoying the incredible world that God has given to us. I believe just that one thing would totally change and revolutionize the world that we live in. I believe that gratitude, when it's practiced is a crazy, powerful tool that God uses to transform lives. I believe that uh, gratitude turns what we have into more than enough. I believe that gratitude, um, it, it turns greed into generosity. I believe the opposite of gratitude is entitlement. I believe that gratitude says, I, I'm so grateful uh, for what I have. And like I said, an attitude of gratitude is not enough. It's like buying somebody a present, wrapping it, and then not giving it to them. Now, gratitude, when it's practiced, is going to be a parent of so many other virtues. It, you know, gratitude is going to be the parent of joy. I do not think that you can experience joy in this world um, without practicing gratitude. I just don't think you can do it. Have you can pull it off, let me know how, because I've just never seen it happen before. You know, gratitude is the parent of joy. It's, uh, it's the parent of balance, harmony. You know, the Old Testament word is uh, shalom. You know, it, it's the parent of that. I, I don't think you can experience balance in life without practicing gratitude. You know, generosity, it happens because of gratitude. Um, you know, we don't want to be known as stingy. We don't want to be known as hoarders. We want to be known as generous. Generosity flows from gratitude. When we realize that God has blessed us, you know, with, with resources, with grace, with forgiveness, with whatever, um, what happens is the recipient then becomes the giver. How can we not give away what God has already generously given to us? 
Um, gratitude is going to change things. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a game changer. Um, you know, it's, it's so cool that it will help us relate to God better. Um, it will help us relate to others better, and it's going to help us uh, relate to ourselves better. So think about, like, your uh, human relationships. Um, I believe that one of the most powerful things that you can do is just look at another person and tell them, I just wanted to thank you. Um, I want you to know that you make my life better. You listen, you listen to me. You're, you're there in the difficult times. Um, you bring joy to my life. Uh, my life is better because of you. Now, two lives are going to be better because of that conversation. You know, your life is the sharer of your gratitude, and their life is the recipient of that. That one simple conversation is it, going to change things. You know, when I, you guys hear it, I do a lot of weddings, and um, one of the things that I always do with the couples, and if I've done your wedding, you've probably done this with me in my office, uh, I always have the couple, like, look at each other. It's kind of weird if they're looking at me when they're saying these things. Um, so I just, like, say, well, just look at each other, and I want you to, like, tell the other person um, just why you're grateful or why you're thankful for them. Then all of a sudden, like, you know, they start talking, and um, they'll say something like, well, I want to thank you for uh, just being patient with me. Um, thank you for working so hard for us. Uh, thank you for cleaning the kitchen. You know, thank you for uh, um, you know, just being so kind to everybody you see. It's just an inspiration to me, and the other person will do it. And then after they're done, I'll actually make them talk about what that was like. You know, what was it like to talk like that? And for most people, well, it's kind of weird, like, you know, we usually don't talk like that. And Well, how did it feel, though, when you're doing it? And, well, it was great. It was great to hear that. It was great to say it. So one of the things I encourage them to do is, like, just do this more often. You know, do this in this relationship with your parents, with your brothers and sisters, kids, co I mean, just we can have these types of conversations where we let other people know that we are thankful for them. It changes relationships. Um, gratitude will change our relationship with God. It really does. Just like that relationship, the interpersonal relationship, has changed because of gratitude. Um, our relationship with God changes when we express gratitude to God. So the psalmist writes, um, this is in Psalm 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So what if each day started off, like the first thing you did when you wake up, um, what if it was just a prayer, like three sentences? Something like, um, God, I'm looking outside and I see the sun and it's, it's a new day and I'm just, I'm so thankful that you give me this day. Lord, I'm uh, thankful for, for new possibilities. Uh, over the next 24 hours, I have some possibilities in front of me, and I, I, I thank you for that. Um, God, I thank you for the recovery that I've experienced in the last uh, month and you know, just how you're working in me, and continue that today. So what if your day started off with like 30 seconds like that? I believe your day would be different, and I, would be, I believe it would be better. So what if at the end of the day, um, your day ended something like this? God, I want to thank you for that... Uh, important lesson I learned today. Um, it was painful, but I want to thank you because uh, I've learned my lesson. Um, God, uh, I thank you that my football team finally won a game. Um, it was really cool to, you know, cheer for a winning team. Um, you know, God, I want to thank you uh, for the word that I got from you this morning when I was reading the Bible. That was really helpful, and it will be really helpful. I believe if you had those two little conversations that I just had, um, I believe that that one minute, I believe that two minute, it would make your day better, it would make your night better, it would make your sleep better, uh, it would make your wake better. So the next one is going to be um, our relationship with ourself. Now let's go back to what Paul said. Um, be thankful in all circumstances. So this is going to be, um, you know, how this works. Uh, the grateful person is actually going to be able to say thank you to everything and everybody and every possibility that brought us to where we are today. The people who invented, uh, invested in us and, and loved us and mentored us. Um, you know, the, the, the things that we've learned from the hard way. So here's how this works. Gratitude, it begins as an attitude, like it's something we choose. Then all of a sudden it becomes like a practice and a habit. And once something becomes a practice and a habit for long enough, then it becomes a lifestyle. So when Paul says, 
uh, be thankful in all circumstances. He's like, I want this to be a lifestyle for you. You're not something that you slip onto once in a while, not something that uh, you do occasionally. I want this to start as an attitude. I want it to become a habit, and then I want it to become a lifestyle. So let's look at how this happens in Luke uh, chapter 17. In verse 11, um, as Jesus continued toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered the village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So he, Jesus, looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. As they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, do you understand what this means, um, to be cleansed of leprosy? So leprosy was a death sentence. Um, it was a very slow and painful and humiliating death. You know, people avoided lepers. Lepers were isolated. You know, not only were their bodies breaking down, um, you know, they had no relationships because people isolated them. Like, what Jesus did here is he gave them a second chance at life. Um, I remember uh, when I went to Emory, um, some of the best hospitals in the world are there. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has their main hospital on the campus at Emory. And um, in one of my classes, I think it was in my second year, uh, we had to do rotations, like being a chaplain, doing hospital visits, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I was at the CDC hospital, walked into this room, didn't know what was wrong with the woman. Um, yeah, she, she just, uh, she did not look good at all. And I, I went up to her and I said, hey, how things go on? And she said, well, uh, for having leprosy, um, you know, things are going all right. You know, I, I saw these flowers, I saw these pictures. Um, you know, this woman, her, her face, her arms were like totally disfigured. Um, you know, I saw a picture of like three like just beautiful kids. I'm guessing these kids were probably between like three and four and maybe like 10 years old. Um, you know, I saw a picture of her and her husband. The husband was a strong looking, handsome man. Now, as I looked at her picture, and I looked at her, I mean, there's no way in the world you could have even told that was the same person. Yes, you know, so I, I sat with her. I mean, we were there for like, I was there for like 30 minutes, and like just to listen to her story, it was amazing to me. Um, she said, you know, this has just caused me to be grateful for everything I have. You know, life was so fast-paced, and I just took things for granted, and I've just been laying here by myself, and I just can't wait to get out and get this new life. And, you know, she's going to be cured. It's curable now. You know, she's going to have some scars to show for it. But it was something like this. This was her car accident. You know, this is what, uh, uh, you know, caused her to look at gratitude. And I asked her as I left, um, I said, can I pray for you? And she said, sure. And I said, what do you want me to pray for? And she told me a few things. And I got down with the prayer, and I, I looked at her face. And, you know, her face was, it had, you know, little bumps on it, and these tears were kind of making it through the little bumps she had, and I looked at her, well, I said, well, thank you for uh, letting me visit you, and, and she looked at me, and she said, uh, thank you for touching me. I didn't realize this, but I was actually holding the hand of a woman with leprosy, and she said, it's been a couple months that someone hasn't touched her with a, a latex glove, and she hadn't felt skin in that long. And so I left and I washed my hands immediately and thoroughly. <laughs> I didn't realize I had done that, but that's what leprosy is like. So when Jesus says, like, these people here healed, this is a big deal. You know, this isn't like the common cold getting better. This is someone with a death sentence, uh, you know, being totally healed. So in verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus. So how many people were healed? Just a quick tri trivia question. So 10 people were healed, and one of them goes back to thank Jesus. So what's that, like 10%? So Jesus, like, here, here's what he said. Um, uh, he fell to the ground, or the guy continues, he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. Now, you can understand why he would do that. Um, this man was a Samaritan, and I'll get to that part in a second, because this is really interesting. But in verse 17, Jesus asked, um, didn't I heal 10 men? Like, it seems like a pretty legitimate question. Uh, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. 
Okay, so now in the Greek, um, that word healed, uh, can we go back to the screen? Um, <coughs> the word uh, healed, um, it's a different word than the actual healing that they experienced from their leprosy. So it was actually the people moving from Jesus to the priest to be healed, very similar to the Old Testament uh, where Naaman the leper was told to go to the prophet and he was healed of leprosy. Um, now, that type of healing was the physical healing. That movement from Jesus to the priest made them well. That type of faith made them well. But Jesus, basically what he's saying here is uh, your faith here has healed you. This type of gratitude to go back to Jesus, this is a different type of healing. This is the spiritual type of healing. You know, so Jesus says our faith makes us well. Jesus says this type of faith, this type of gratitude, what this is going to do is this is going to heal us in a different way. This is like a spiritual healing that uh, we're talking about here. Now, when Jesus uh, told the grateful leper that he'd been made well, um, what he meant is now you're saved. Um, you know, so what happened here is like the religious people, those uh, 10 who weren't from Samaritan, or uh, the Samaritans, the non-Samaritans, what happened here was... Uh, excuse me. What happened there was like they were entitled... They thought, okay, this is our religion. Um, you know, we should be helped out. We deserve this. Where the new one, the outsider, the one with this deep faith, he goes back and he says, thank you. This healing I have, it's, it's because of you. Now, the opposite of generosity is going to be this entitlement. Um, so what we're going to look at um, is ways that uh, we can express and live out uh, gratitude. Now, number one um, is going to be to choose this, okay? Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you get to choose gratitude or you can choose entitlement. Uh, you can choose gratitude or you can uh, choose comparison. You, know, you can choose gratitude and focus on the things you do have or you can focus on the things you don't have. You know, that's your choice. Uh, number two, don't waste time and energy reliving past hurts. You know, we all got some of those. I would say this, like, let's learn from our past and not linger there. You know, let's be grateful for the lessons that we've learned and, and move forward. Don't spoil what you have by being obsessed by what you don't have. The next one is going to be uh, reflect on the blessings that we do have. The spiritual ones, the emotional ones, the physical ones, the financial ones, whatever. Um, you know, keep that journal, write down those things on that card. Um, this then becomes the foundation for contentment and generosity and prosperity. Number four is going to be to accept gratefully. Give other people the chance uh, to practice gratitude. Um, give other people the chance to do that. Um, number five, um, go beyond what's considered normal. Just really do that. When we're being uh, uh, grateful, um, let's not do it in small ways. Let's not do it in predictable ways. Let's really, like, take a big step and, and do it in a big way. And last is uh, give cheerfully. So what happens is gratitude turns into generosity. You know, so the same forgiveness that God has given us, let's give to others. Let's listen to them. Let's give their, our time, our energy, our, our resources. Now here's what happens. You are going to be blessed by doing this, and others will be blessed by doing this as well. So, um, Many of you are in small groups, and some of you are doing the individual study on the internet. It's like we've made 10 videos uh, in the last couple months or so, and you know, it's not like I just sit in front of a camera for 10 minutes, and you know, we do this, and it's done. Um, you know, we kind of do different things, and you know, we've done these at cool places. You know, we shot some of it at Platte River State Park. We shot one downtown. We shot one at uh, you know, Walnut Grove Park. Um, there's one day we were going to do one outside, but it was just too windy, and we had to get it done that day. So we actually shot this one at my house. Now, normally, this would probably take about an hour and a half to two hours if we're pretty uh, you know, savvy and don't have too many hiccups. Um, so this one started off pretty good, but about 30 minutes into the shoot, all of a sudden, um, like one of my fire alarms started going off. Not like the beep, 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 beep constant, but like every like 45 seconds, like beep. It's so, like I'm right in the middle of like one of the shoots and beep. Like, oh. So then like all of them started doing this. I don't know how they talked to each other. I don't know if they like put the bat. We had like, you know, eight fire alarms in our house and 12 of them were going off. Like I was like finding new fire alarms and I was like, seriously, I was getting really frustrated with this. Like 
I would like take a battery out of the case and then I'd like put it in there and it would still beep and I couldn't tell which one's beeping because like some of them are like three feet apart from each other. So I later found out that my little guy David, what he did is like he'll just go like take a clean battery and put the old one in there and I can't tell which ones are new or not. And <laughs> the two people I'm working with, they're not willing to stick their tongue on it to tell me like how <laughs> much juice these things have. So seriously, I was like totally frustrated. Then like Esther, our dog, like she was fine for the first couple hours, but like, you know, she was getting tired of having to be quiet and like she was barking. I tried to put her downstairs. She was barking. The fire alarms are going off. And we're, I'm talking about gratitude in this video. So like, oh, God, oh. <laughs> Gratitude is an attitude. <laughs> and like, so finally, like everything was done and um, I actually like, I mean, Leandra, uh, our intern, and Amber, the woman that does the videos for us, like I, I apologized to him. I said like, I'm sorry, this was like not me at my best. Um, you know, and uh, after they left, I just thought about it for a little bit and I thought to myself like, you know, I actually have a lot to be grateful for. Um, that wasn't like the best uh, two and a half hours of my life, but I actually have a house and I have fire alarms at work in case the thing, I have a dog that loves me and licks me and, uh, you know, and I have these two women that were so patient with me, I'd be proud to call either one of my daughter. Um, you know, they're kind of quirky, they're patient, and they're Green Bay Packers fans. They got all three things, so. Um, but I think, like, um, I want us to remember that word, that one word, thanks. I want us to remember that word, thanks, because it changes everything. You know, just say thanks to God. And God, thank you for my life. Thank you for this day. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for new possibilities. Thank you for hope. Thank you for friends. Thank you for kids. Thank you for big black dogs. Thank you. You look at someone else and say thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for serving me. Thank you for making my life better. And when we do that, um, our relationship with God's going to grow. Our relationship with others will be blessed, but you're going to be blessed as well. That one word, it will, it will do something big in you. You have experienced it, but I, I, I've observed this over 20 years. Uh, the people with the most joy, the people with the most contentment, the people with uh, the most happiness, they're also the most grateful people. So uh, I want you to listen. Um, as I go through this uh, institution of the Lord's Supper. And, you know, some churches actually call this the Great Thanksgiving. Now, it's important to know where Jesus was at this point in his life. He was going to die the next day. Jesus knew that he was going to die a very painful, humiliating death on a cross. Like, he knew this. Now, I want you to listen to what he says. Jesus took the bread. Um, what did he do next? He gave what? Okay, so he's going to die the next day. Jesus gave thanks. He broke the bread. He blessed it and said, this is my body that is given for you. When you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, Jesus took the wine. The Bible says that he gave thanks. He says, this is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for you and the forgiveness of your sins. When you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. So as you're given the bread today, um, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember a man who spent his entire life giving gratitude to God and giving gratitude to others and teaching us all about this one word, thanks, that can totally change everything. You might remember like three or four minutes ago, I said one of the best things we can do is give other people the chance to practice gratitude with us. And as you take the bread and dip into the juice, that's what we're giving Jesus the chance to do here. Jesus says, this is my blood. Um, it's the blood of the new covenant that has been given for you and the forgiveness of your sins. And this is how we respond to Jesus' gratitude to us as we accept his forgiveness so that we're not captives anymore by our past, but we're free. We're not um, you know, embattled or beleaguered by what happened once, but we see the possibilities of what's in front of us. So let's go to God and let's pray.